Amen. The presence of God is so faithful, so good. I just want to take a, another minute or two in God's presence as we were worshiping. God spoke that word that God's love is enough. God's love is enough. Bethany shared 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I, I really love that verse because it says he is faithful. Faithfulness means time and time and time and time again. He is faithful. He'll do it. But it's not just because he wants to, but it says he is faithful just. Just talks about the justice or the legal right to be able to do something. And it's God's divine law that he says, because of what Jesus did on the cross, it is just, it is right, it is legally binding for me to be able to forgive you. He is faithful and he is just. According to the divine law, God can forgive your sins. It's not just because he wants to or because he's got a good heart towards you. It's legal. It's according to God's divine law that it's that he's able to. And even sometimes we might not understand all of the details of it and all the results of it, but it's true. It's true. He is faithful and he is just. And as we do, confess. And as we do, believe. We enter into that relationship with God. Not just because God has a nice heart, but because it's legal. The way has been opened. The veil has been torn. There is a way for us because of what Jesus did. It's a legal way that we can enter into relationship with God. And this is... This is the type of love. Listen to this in Romans 8. Romans 8 says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us? So once we enter into that relationship of love, who can separate us? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, because of you we are putting, being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the love that we enter into by God's faithfulness, by God's just divine law. So if, you, if you've thought, man, I've gone too far, I've done too much. No, God's faithful, God's just, this is the love. This is the love that we all have access to. And if you are watching out there and maybe you've never given your life to the Lord, please contact us. It's hard for us to know exactly what God's doing in your heart, but we want to stay connected with you. So send us a direct message. Send us a, a personal message to our uh, New Life Fellowship Facebook account. We want to talk to you. We want to pray with you. We want to give you resources to be able to grow in your, in your relationship with God in order to uh, uh, come to that love and live in that love and begin your journey with Jesus. We want to know that. Even though we're separated because of, you know, this virus thing that's going on, that's okay. We can still stay connected. But we need you to take that step and we would ask, please get in contact with us. We want to share God's love with you. This is the first step, us talking about it, 
telling you about it, but we need, a, as a response, we want to, we need you guys to, to, to talk to us. So, so send us a message, call us. Our phone numbers are on our Facebook page, but we'd love to talk with you, pray with you, get, get you some resources, help you along the way, and we'll begin that journey with Jesus together. Amen. What a great time in the presence of God. Thank you guys so much for leading us. Thank you guys. You guys can. Thank you. All right. God is good. He is so good and so faithful. We've been going on in this series based on the Ten Commandments. And this is the last week. The last week for for our series on the Ten Commandments. Uh, we've talked from the beginning about why God gave us the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were not given for us to make God happy. God's already happy. He's a good God. He's a happy God. He's full of joy. God, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. That means God's got joy already. We don't have to make him happy by keeping a bunch of laws. No. But the commandments were given so that we can have joy and happiness and fulfillment and good relationships with God, good relationships with others. And as a result, we can live lives of happiness. We can live lives of joy and contentment. The, it's interesting, the very, very first recorded sermon of Jesus is in Matthew chapter 5. And the whole, the whole first part of it, uh, it's known as the Beatitudes, but each part, each verse begins with the word, blessed is the man who, da 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 blessed is the man who, da 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 But if you look at it, the actual meaning of it is happy is the man, or fulfilled is the person who does this. In Khmer, me and Sopet Mongkol, means the person who has happiness, the person who's filled with joy, is the person who does da 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 And so... God wants for us to live a fulfilled life. He wants for us to live a happy life. He wants us not to have lives filled with pain as a result of our own sinful actions. He doesn't want us to be a slave to sin, but he wants us to live in freedom. And that's why we have these laws, because if we live by them, we'll live in good relationships with God, and we'll get, live in good relationships with others. And so these Laws were given not as a set of rigid commands, but they were given as, a, uh, as, as principles for us to live by. And this is what we've been looking at in this series. So as a review, I just want to go through all of the principles that we talked about already. The first is the principle of priority. Putting God first. Not just first, and then we can have all of our other quote-unquote little g gods after him. No, he wants to be the only God, the only one in the room. The principle of purity. Okay, God wants us to live lives of purity in honoring him and not having other uh, gods. He wants us to live as people who are made in the image of God. God wants us to live with the principle, the third one, the principle of humility. The fourth is the principle of rest. The fifth is the principle of honor. Next is the principle of love. The next is the principle of intimacy, the principle of trust. And last week we talked about the principle of honesty and how important it is to have lives and to live lives where we are telling the truth. We are true to ourselves. We don't lie to ourselves. We don't deceive ourselves. We don't say that things are one way when really they're a different way. We're truthful with ourselves, we're truthful with others, and we're truthful with God. God is our standard. Today we're going to talk about the 10th commandment. And if you look in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, we will see the 10th commandment. And that verse goes like this, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. 
Let me read that one more time. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And this principle, the command is do not covet. But the principle here is the principle of contentment. The principle of contentment. Contentment or being content means that we are choosing to be satisfied with what we have. Choosing to be satisfied with what we have. Now, if we look at the word coveting, in the original language, in Hebrew, it talks about not just a desire or a want for something, but it is a strong desire, a motivating desire, something that moves us and something that pushes us. It's a strong, strong desire for something. And I think it's important for us to remember that God doesn't want to take away our desires. It's okay to desire things. It's okay to want things. Okay? But like we've already established from the very, very beginning of the commandments, number one, let's make sure that the things that we're desiring are not above God. Nothing else should be above God. We should always be, like it says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you as well. So in this principle, it's okay to desire things, but let's not put things above God. Let's not make things an idol in our lives where we are putting things, we're trusting in things rather than trusting in God. If you're trusting in your money to save you, rather than trusting in God, then you have an idol in your life. If you are trusting in your education to save you, rather than trusting in God, then you have an idol in your life. So with this principle of contentment, it's not saying don't desire things. Okay? It's okay to desire things, but let's not put things in the wrong place. But this command says don't desire something that belongs to somebody else. Don't desire your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's house or his field or his male servant or his manservant or his female ser servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So he's saying, let's not always be looking, oh man, he's got something better than mine. His car is nicer. His moto is nicer. His wife is prettier. Don't covet something that belongs to somebody else. Now, okay, let's look at, let, let's, let's take a look, for example. Let's think about something. Is it okay to want, for example, to want a house? You want a house for your family to live in? You have a desire to live in a house? Is it wrong to have that desire? No, it's not. But once you start saying, man, look at his house. When you look at my house and you compare my house to his house, man, he's got a way nicer house. I want his house rather than my house. That's, that's where the sin comes in, in, is in coveting. Okay? But to desire something that God allows and God provides, great. God can make provision for you. God can open the doors for that to happen in your life. But this verse specifically says, don't want something that belongs to somebody else. Don't desire something that belongs to somebody else. We'll look at the meaning, the exact meaning of that in just, in just a few minutes. But I want to look at one verse in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And it's a verse that a lot of us are familiar with. It's a verse that we've probably heard a number of times. And I'm going to read the last part of the verse as a way of reminding us about what this verse says. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's the last part 
of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And it's a quote from the book of Joshua, when Joshua is going into the promised land, God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. But look at the beginning of chapter, of, sorry, of Hebrews, of the verse in Hebrews. And I'm going to read the whole verse. And I think it's going to open our eyes a little bit to this whole idea of covetousness. And in the New King James Version, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. So let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. And then it says, For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So the opposite of covetousness is being content. And God's saying here, he says, Be content with what you have. Why? Because I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So God's saying, I'm with you always. I'm never going to leave your side. Always, always, always. I'm always with you. So, be content. Don't be covetous. The way that we can break through, break free from covetousness, is to realize God's with me, and he's never going to leave me nor forsake me. Always. He's always with me. And so if you are, you, if you have had a habit of comparing or being covetous, or, or, or being covetous, and you start to think, man, I really need a breakthrough. This verse can be that breakthrough for you. Realize, understand, God's with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. God is with me. I don't have to have what he has. I don't have to look like she does. I don't have to do this or do that. No. God's with me, and he'll never leave me nor forsake me. When we've, we've talked in this series about a couple other things, a couple other principles. One of them was when we talked about the Sabbath law, and that one was the principle of rest. We've also talked about the law of do not steal. That one was the principle of trust. Contentment chooses, makes the decision that I am going to rest and trust in God. And trust and rest in the provision that he has brought for me. I'm choosing contentment. I'm choosing contentment rather than covetousness. And that's the way that God wants for us to live. And every one of these laws has an aspect of trusting God. He's the one God. He's the, he's the first God. We have to trust him in order to do that. The Israelites, they didn't have, God said, don't make any graven image. All of the other nations around them had idols and they were bowing down to them. But God said, no, I want you to trust me. You don't need an idol. You don't need a graven image. No, trust me. And each aspect of these laws has a principle of trusting God. And this one is just the same. Be content. The way to be content is to know that God is our Father and that he will never leave us nor forsake us. You look at it on the flip, on the flip side, on the other side. The, way that, the only reason that we would be covetousness, covetous, sorry, is because we want something that somebody else has. Okay, so that's the definition of, covet of coveting. You think about Adam and Eve in the garden. Adam and Eve in the garden, when the Satan tempted them, they, Satan tempted them, the serpent tempted them, and put within them a desire for something that belonged to God. It was the wisdom, the knowledge, like God. And that was the temptation. It was a, a coveting temptation. They said, 
yeah, I want to be, I want what God has. I want what God has. I want to be like God. I want his wisdom. I want his authority. And, you know, even that's what Lucifer, that's the sin that Lucifer had. He wanted to be like God. He wanted something that somebody else had. Covetousness causes us to resent God because we feel like God is providing something for somebody else, but he's not providing it for me. He's providing something for somebody else, but he's not providing it for me. And it causes us to be discontented inside. It causes us to not be at peace inside of us because we're always looking, we're always comparing, we're always wanting what somebody else wants. Listen to a couple of these verses that talk about coveting. And I want you to see how serious God takes coveting. And, and in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read a verse in uh, chapter 5, verse 11. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. Look at all of the other sins that are around coveting. Okay? 1 Corinthians 5, verse 11 it says, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an adulterer, or sorry, or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner. Don't even eat with such a person. So God takes coveting very, very seriously. Because coveting puts something above God. And it puts desires in us that don't trust God. That say, God, you're not good enough to me. Because you gave something to them, but you didn't give it to me. Listen, here's Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. We think of things like sexual immorality or uncleanness. We think, yeah, those are really big sins. Then, then they throw in there covetousness. They put covetousness. In. How can just wanting something be bad? Because it's not just wanting something, but it's comparing with somebody else. It's wanting what somebody else has or wants that you don't have a right to because it belongs to somebody else. If we look at the verse in Exodus 20 verse 17, it has kind of a list of all of the things that we need to make sure that we don't covet. It talks about a person's wife or his manservant or his male servant or his ox or his donkey. And so it can be everything like an ox in those days that represented a person's wealth. And how much land they had. Because as many, as, as if they had a big piece of land, then they had to have a lot of oxen. Because the ox were the, the oxen were the, uh, kind of the tools that they used. They didn't have tractors in those days, but they used the oxen to plow the fields and to sow the seeds and all that. So if they had a lot of oxen, then them, that meant they were very wealthy. Donkeys were what they used for traveling. Okay, they would travel from place to place on the donkey. So... It could represent people's wealth, could represent coveting somebody's home, it could represent coveting their mode of transportation, motor motorcycle or car or anything like that. So God's saying, don't covet any of that stuff. Trust me. I'm your heavenly father. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So just trust me. What I do for that person, how I bless that person, that's the business between them and God. That's none of your business. But I will provide for you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. But don't compare with other people. Content means happy and satisfied. Content is choosing. I am choosing to be content with what I have. It's interesting, there's a couple of different verses, or a couple of different English words. Contentment 
and contention. And they're really similar words, but they have very, very different meanings. Contention would be strife and pressure between two or competition or struggle or a quarrel between two people. Contentment means I'm choosing peace. I'm choosing to, to, to allow myself to be satisfied with what I have. God doesn't want us to, be, to have a struggle inside. God doesn't want us to have a struggle with other people. God doesn't want us to be in competition with them. Okay? God doesn't want us competing. Who can have the nicest car? Who can have the most money? Who can have the nicest house? Because there's always going to be somebody who has more. There's always going to be more money that you don't have that somebody else has. There's always going to be a bigger house or a nicer car. You can buy a new car today and tomorrow there's going to be another newer car. So don't always be in competition. Don't always be wanting what other people want. Because when we compare with other people, what, there's only two results that happen. Okay? If you compare yourself with somebody, one of those people, if, you, if you're comparing with, between two people, one person is going to feel inferior and the other person is going to feel superior. Meaning one's going to feel, one person is going to feel less, the other person is going to feel proud, uh, prideful. When we compare, it always makes us either feel proud, oh yeah, look at me, I got more than they do. Or it's going to make us feel inferior or ashamed. Oh, I'm nothing. They have way more than me. And so God doesn't want us competing like that. God doesn't want us to feel like, okay, yeah, I'm greater, or they're greater than me because I have nothing, they have a lot. God doesn't want us living that kind of life. Think about it. If God, if God looks down from heaven, and he sees us from heaven, and he sees us always comparing, and when we compare, sometimes we're proud, sometimes we're ashamed, and he's like, hey, I'm always with you. I'm never going to leave you. I, I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to give you everything that you need. But yet, you're never going to be happy. Because sometimes you're going to be uh, full of pride, and other times you're going to feel ashamed because you feel like you don't have anything compared to somebody else. But God wants us to stop looking around at other people and stop comparing and start looking to him. Because when we're always comparing with this person and that person, we're not looking to the God who is always with us and will never leave us or forsake us. And we get our eyes off of God and get our eyes on what everybody else has. And then our lives are filled with covetousness. And God doesn't want that. He wants us to trust him at all times. I'd even be careful if I were you when using social media. You know, social media is very deceptive because people only post the nicest pictures. They could probably take like a thousand pictures and there's one good picture of their nice new car or, you know, the meal that they're eating or something like that. And they put it on, they put it on Instagram or Facebook or whatever and it looks awesome. And you start to think, man, they have the life. They have a great life. They're eating at all these great restaurants, driving a nice car. Everything looks happy, and everybody's smiling in all the pictures. Of course, everybody's smiling in the pictures. No one says, all right, cheese, and then they all look grumpy. You know, that's not the way it is. So with, with social media, we can be led to believe that somebody's life is great all the time, but maybe they're having that meal or eating eating that food, but they're really unsatisfied. They're not happy. Maybe they're arguing with their, their uh, husband or wife or something like that. So be careful when you're on social media that you don't start coveting somebody else's life. The third point is 
delight before desires. I didn't really read the second point. Second point is contentment versus contention. Let's be content and not comparing all the time. But but let's have, the third point is delight before desires. Psalm 37 verse 4. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So this verse, the first part of it, delight yourself in the Lord, means find joy in the Lord. Find joy in the Lord. Delight in him. Means put your hope in God. Put your joy in God. Delight in God. Look to him. Find joy in the presence of God. Find joy in worship and praise. Find joy in his ways and in his word and praying. Delight yourself in the Lord. And this is, once again, just like contentment, this is a decision we have to make because it's not something that just comes automatically, but it's, it's like saying, choose to delight in God. And then the, the second part of the verse says, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And it's important for us to understand that that it's not, it, the meaning of this verse is not delight yourself in the Lord and God will give you everything else you ever wanted. It's not necessarily the meaning of that word, of that verse. But what it means is if you choose to delight in God, he will give you the right desires for your heart. You will start desiring the things that God wants when you delight yourself in him. And you'll stop desiring the newest phone or the, the nicest car or eating at the greatest place or whatever. You'll stop desiring all that because now, man, I, I, I just find joy in, in, in God. I just find delight in the presence of God. I just find delight in God. And he becomes what fills you rather than the emptiness of trying to get the nicest, greatest thing that somebody else has. So delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires for your heart. You will receive the right desires. Another key for contentment is thankfulness. Is thankfulness. Covetousness always looks at what I don't have. And it's never satisfied. It's never satisfied. Because there's always something more that you don't have. But thankfulness focuses on, focuses on what you have already. And it's, and it's a good practice. And I would encourage each and every one of you, before you go to bed at night or when you wake up in the morning, choose to say, I'm thankful for these 10 things. I'm thankful for my health. I'm thankful for the house that I live in. I am thankful for the relationships that I have. I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful for salvation. I'm thankful. And the more you focus on the things that you do have and are thankful for those things, you'll start to feel the joy because then you'll say, man, I am so blessed. I have so many great things already. Whereas if you're always looking at the things you don't have, you're going to feel like, man, you ha I have nothing. I, there's no blessing in my life. I ask God for this or I want this and I want that. And I just feel so empty because I don't know. Once you are focused on the things that you do have and are thankful for those things, that contentment will fill your life and you will realize how truly blessed you are. Let me read three more verses before we finish here today. I'm going to read the, the verse in Hebrews 13 one more time. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself, Jesus himself, has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. This is his promise to us. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. 
he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. This is when Paul was talking about the thorn in his side, the problems that he was having. And he prayed to God and asked God to take him away. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Even if I don't take this away, my grace is enough for you. My grace is sufficient. We can make it through this together. Even if all the problems don't go away, he's saying, Paul, I can do it. We can do it together. We can make it through. And what a beautiful picture that is. It's a beautiful picture that even if God doesn't give us all that we want, we can walk through it together with him. Because what else? What, tell me something that's greater than living a life, walking with God, making it through the difficult times with him, side by side with him. My grace is enough. And then Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? At the end of the day, we have the greatest gift of all. And that's Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. The greatest gift, more than what your neighbor has, or what he has or she has, is what we all have in Jesus. For God so loved the world. God so loved you. God so loved your neighbor. That whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the greatest gift of all. And for those of us who are Christians and I believe in the Lord, let your life be filled with thankfulness. Let your life be filled with God. I've got it all already. Sometimes I feel challenged in my own life and I ask the hard question. Sometimes I think, if God never gave me another thing, would Jesus be enough? And if, it's, if the answer is no, then my priorities are wrong. But if I can say, yes, Jesus, you are enough. You are enough. You've given me everything. You've laid your life down for me. How could I covet something else that is so unfulfilling? You've given me enough. And I choose to find joy and to find delight in the things that you have blessed me with. Because what you have given me is enough. And so, uh, today, I choose contentment. Contentment, yes, but it's not like a, a, a contentment where we've given up. It's not a, a contentment where we say, okay, all right, God, it's, God's given me enough. No, it's a contentment that's filled with, I have it all already. I have enough already. Jesus has given me everything. And then look at all of the other things that he's blessed me with. God is with us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your faithful presence. We thank you that you are faithful and that you are just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And not just to take away our sins, but to lead us into that abundant life. An abundant life of your goodness 
of your filling, of your, of your grace and of your love. And Lord, today, as a church family, we invite you into our own personal lives. Holy Spirit, we open up our hearts for you to work in our lives. And God, we pray that in the areas where we have been discontented, where we have been coveting other things, God, we pray you would forgive us. Let us not be like that anymore. Let us not put things above you and above your provision for us, but give us hearts of thankfulness. Help us to have the discipline of saying thank you so that our hearts can be turned to you and not turned to the things that we don't have. God, forgive us, but help us to grow. Holy Spirit, speak to us and teach us each and every day when we have those covetous desires. In your gentle voice, just speak to us and, and correct us. We invite you to do that. And help us to be people who live with joy in the provision and the, and the contentment in what you have given us. Lord, we love you. We love you dearly. We don't want our desires to get in the way of our relationship with you or our relationship with others. We don't want to be in competition. We want to have good relationships, God. So, so we commit to moving away from covetousness and moving towards you and moving towards contentment. God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for these Ten Commandments and this series that we've been able to study with you, God. I just pray, God, that you would continue to remind us from day to day. Remind us of the things that we've learned and help us to continue to grow in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of things before we finish is once again, if you guys, anybody out there at home or wherever you're watching from, if you need prayer, please send us a direct message at... Uh, on our New Life Fellowship Facebook page or comments in our YouTube channel or call our office. We have a staff of pastors who would love to speak with you, pray with you, stay connected with you, help you, help you to grow. And we also, have, we also have small groups where we meet together on a regular basis. And even though we can't get together as a big group, we still want to get together from time to time and study the Word of God, pray together, be a support to each other during these times. Also, if you need to, to give of your tithes and offerings, we also have those options available online as well. But I just want to say we love you, New Life Fellowship. We love you to all the people who are out there watching from different churches, different places all around the world. God bless you guys. Stay safe and stay in the presence of God and in His grace. Blessings. God bless you guys. Amen.